<laughs> Very good. <laughs> that is really <laughs> dog in box. <laughs> Genius. <laughs> Hi Year 11, welcome back to your next lesson for Mathematics. We're starting off with a flashback question uh, about probability. We have in a workplace of 25 employees, each person speaks either French or German, or some speak both. 36% of the people speak German and 20% speak both French and German. Okay, first question, calculate the probability that a person chosen could speak German given that they speak French. Now, this is a pretty tough question that can be turned into a very easy question if you draw the correct diagram. If your Venn diagram sensor is going crazy right now, I'm right there with you. Let's get one sketched up. So we're gonna have French speakers and German speakers. Okay, now we know that 36% of the employees speak German. So 36% of 25. Cool little math hack for you. We can work backwards here and we can instead do 25% of 36. So a quarter is nine. Boom, no calculators needed. Awesome. Now we also know that 20% speak both French and German. 20% is a fifth. So a fifth of 25 is going to be five. Now the issue with that is now my German circle, which is a weird phrase, is saying that we have 14 people who speak German when we're only supposed to have nine people that speak German. So we're gonna fix this by turning that nine into a four, and now we have nine German speakers, but five of those people also speak French. That's a slight trick to it. So we've got five and four here makes nine. So there must be 16 people left over to go in the French only circle just here. Okay, so calculate the probability someone could speak German given that they speak French. So given that we're choosing out of these 21 French speakers, what's the chances we get someone who's also in the German circle? Well, we've got a five out of 21 chance, okay? Five German speakers out of 21 French speakers. So this says probability of speaking German given that they speak French. Question B, calculate the probability that a person could not speak French if they could speak German. So if they could speak German, so we're choosing from our nine German speakers, what's the probability that they do not speak French? So we've got to be outside the French circle. So we're choosing these four out of these nine. So well done if you said four out of nine. So this is probability of not French, given that we're choosing from the German people. All right, sweet. So as we saw in the last topic, a lot of really complex sounding probability questions just needs to draw a little quick picture and then it becomes super easy. All right, today we're doing something that you probably haven't done since primary school. We are learning a new number. Today's lesson is uh, on Euler's number. So a lot of people want to pronounce this name as Euler. It's actually pronounced Euler. So it was a uh, really, 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 really famous mathematician from back in the day. He discovered um, very significant parts of the mathematical world. That's a really terrible way of saying it, but he's a big deal is what I'm trying to say. All right, we're gonna start off by um, theoretically investing some money. So let's say we are investing a dollar into a bank that's gonna give us 100% per annum compound interest. So every year, they're gonna give us 100% of our investment. So let's do some calculations using our compound interest formula, which you may be familiar with from year nine or 10. We're gonna make the present value $1. One plus 100% written as a decimal is 1.00. To the power of one year, that works out to be as expected, $2. We have grown by 100% in one year. What if we change the scenario and we say, what if instead our interest was being calculated every six months? What that means is, uh, what if rather than getting 100% interest over the course of the year, what if we got 50% interest in the first half of the year and then 50% interest in the second half of the year? So this is called compounding every six months. We are recalculating our interest payment um, twice throughout the year. So this means we're going to divide our 100% interest rate into a 50% interest rate, so we're dividing by two. And instead of one year, we are doing two half years. Okay, so it's the same interest rate and it's the same period of time. We're just recalculating at the halfway point. 
This works out to get us a little bit more money. We get $2.25. So if you recalculate your interest more frequently, you're going to grow faster. Yeah. Okay, what if we uh, were even better and we were calculating our interest every month? That means we're going to divide our interest rates into 12 monthly interest rates. And instead of doing one year, we're gonna do 12 months. So we're gonna do the power of 12. That calculation works out to be about $2.61. So now we're getting even more money from our $1 investment. What if we got even more serious and we calculated our interest every single day? So our calculation now looked like this. Dividing by 365 for a per day rate to the power of 365 days. We get even more cash. We get $2.71. So it's pretty clear to me that the more frequently we calculate our interest, the faster our investment is growing. But the question is, is there a ceiling to this or is there some number that we will not grow above? The question we're gonna answer is, what is the most amount of money you can get from $1 in one year? So how could we do more uh, common compounds than daily? What if we got real theoretical now and we said, what if we were compounding nonstop? So every single instant, we were dividing our interest rate and we were applying it. So now we're going to divide our 100% interest rate by infinity. We're gonna raise this to the power of infinity and we wanna see how much money we can get. Now, unfortunately, we can't actually calculate this because uh, infinity is not a number. We can't put it into our Casio calculator. What we can look at is uh, what this thing tends to as X tends to infinity. So as this fraction here and this power here turns into a really, really, really big number, what does this answer tend towards? And what uh, Euler figured out many, many years ago is that this will not grow any higher than $2.71.82818288. That number there, it goes on forever. It's kind of like pi, it's an irrational constant, it never ends, and it's a really, really important number, and we call this number Euler's number. Okay, so 2.718, henceforth in this course, will be called Euler's number, and for short, we represent it by the lowercase letter E. All right, so in mathematics, when you see the letter E, um, it's referring to this mathematical constant here, which is a really important number, which we're going to look at uh, throughout this lesson and the next lesson as well. So in your notes, you can fill in that uh, Euler's number is an irrational constant. It's got some really interesting properties, um, especially with regards to calculus, which is going to be tomorrow's lesson. Okay, we represent it by lowercase e. Um, there's a bit of debate over why Euler chose e for his letter. It's not just because his name starts with e. There's a few other good arguments for why it's e rather than something else. But I'm not going to bore you with them. Okay, so e is approximately 2.718. That's really as far as we're going to take it. It obviously goes forever, but we don't have all day to write decimal places. So we're just going to use the e button on our calculator. So if you grab your Casio Calc, have a look-see. Um, mine might be a bit different to you, but there's a key on the right that says LN, or it looks like IN. If you look above that, you should have an E to the something button. Or alternatively, down the bottom next to pi, above the times 10 to the X button, next to that, there should be a button for E. That's built into your calculator as 2.718, um, etc., etc. All right, cool. So let's look at some sketching of the function Y equals E to the power of X. So remember, this e to the power of x, it's really just 2.718 bloody bloody blah, blah to the power of x. e is a number. And because this is an exponential function, like we were sketching in the previous lesson, it's going to have an exponential shape like this. It's still going to pass through 1 on the y-axis because anything to the power of 0, even if it's a magic number, you still get an answer of 1. So we have a y-intercept of 1. We're also going to put on a bit of extra information just to show off. We're going to say that when the value of x in this function is uh, 1, what we get here is we get y equals e to the power of 1, which is, of course, just e. So it's going to have a y value of e, which is going to be about 2.71, blah, 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 which is about there. That's 1, that's 2, that's 3. So that right there is about 2.7, which is going to be represented by e. Okay, up next, we're going to think about what would happen if we took this function, this y equals e to the x, and we multiplied it by 2. 
All right, so all these y values are going to be doubled. So this e right here is gonna turn into a 2e, which is not gonna fit on the page. This one for the y-intercept is gonna be doubled up and turned into a two. So there is our new y-intercept. So it's the exact same shape, it's just a bit steeper because we've, we've, um, we've taken every coordinate and we've just doubled its height. We still have the asymptote as any exponential function does of approaching zero as you go farther left. This red line is never ever going to touch or cross the x-axis on either of these graphs. Okay, and now for y equals e to the 2x. Now, because our power has been doubled, we're going to climb a bit faster. So we're gonna have a bit of a steeper shape as well. However, our y-intercept, if we made x zero, we would have e to the two times zero. So we would have e times e to the zero. So we would still have an x, in, sorry, a y-intercept of one. So we're gonna try and draw the same rough shape as this first graph. We're just gonna make it a little bit steeper here and a little bit steeper here. So we have a y intercept of one, and now if we subbed one into this function, we would get e to the two times one, we would get e squared. So this graph is not to scale because e squared would be 2.7 squared, that'd be about 7.4 something, I think. Okay, so there are three different types of exponential graphs. We've got e to the x, 2e to the x, and e to the 2x. If you wanna play around with some more, as always, go to Desmos and um, have a look and see what changing the numbers do to the picture. Let's have a look at a few more. So now we've got a good sketch of y equals e to the x. We're gonna do a sketch of y equals e to the x minus one and y equals e to the x all take away one. All right, so I want you to see if you can remember from the function topic, what we said happens when you change the input from x to x minus one. I'll give you a hint, it's gonna shift left or right. I want you to think about which way you think it should go, left or right. So the x ones are a bit counterintuitive because when we put a minus up with our input, which is the x value, it feels like the x's should be going minus one, but they're actually gonna go the other way, which we looked at in class. So this graph here is gonna be y equals e to the x shifted across to the right by one unit. So that coordinate right there of zero one is gonna move across and it's gonna become one, one. All right, exact same shape, just one unit shifted to the right. And for this third one, we're gonna take e to the x and we're gonna subtract one, which means we're gonna take the entire function and we're gonna shift it down by one unit. So the y value or the height of the function is going to lower by one unit. So now our asymptote, which was previously the x axis is now going to be the line y equals minus one. So exact same shape, one unit shifted down. Okay, we're gonna do a couple more. For the next one, we have y equals one minus e to the x. Now this one, in my opinion, becomes a lot less confusing if you just rearrange the way that the question is written. When I look at this function, I think to myself, this is negative e to the x and then positive one smushed together. So if you want, you could smush them in the other way. We could have negative e to the x at the front. We could have the positive one at the back. Now to me, this seems a bit more logical that we're gonna take e to the x, we're going to make it negative, and then we're going to shift it up by one. So here's our e to the x. What do you think putting a negative at the front is going to do? Uh, what do you think, Ella? Yeah, that's good. It's gonna turn it upside down across the x-axis. So there's gonna be y equals negative e to the x. And now Jamie, if we add one, it's going to very good, it's going to shift up by one unit. So our new asymptote is the line y equals one. Okay, beautiful. And now for the last graphing question from today's lesson, we have y equals e to the negative x, and then we're going to shift that up by one again. So I want you to see if you can think what changing the input from x to negative x is going to do. What do you reckon, Ollie? As always, you are correct. It's going to flip the function across the y-axis. So we're gonna flip, uh, we're gonna flip vertically or across the y-axis. So instead of going from left to right, we're going to go from right to left. So this shape here is uh, what's known as exponential decay. So from left to right, we are decreasing rather than increasing. Now the plus one is going to shift us up by one unit. And so we have again, a new asymptote and there you go. Hope you enjoyed those graphs because they took about three years of my life to make. So I hope you appreciate them. Okay, up next, we're going to have a question about a function that uses e as its base. 
So we have the temperature in degrees Celsius of coffee left in a room for t minutes is given by this function. What this basically means is if you put in a value for time, this calculation is going to give you the temperature of the coffee. Okay, question A is find the initial temperature. So I drilled into you guys in class that when you say initial, you are meant to think um, time equal to zero. So we're going to take this function here. We're going to make the value of t equal to zero. All right, so our power is now negative 0.05 times nothing. So we get nothing here. e to the power of zero, like any number, anything to the power of zero is just one. So we're going to have 60 multiplied by one is 60. And then we'll have 20 plus 60 to get us our answer of 80. All right, so this turns into zero. e to the zero turns into one. That turns into 60. And we get our initial temperature of 80. So the coffee was initially 80 degrees. Question B, find the temperature after 10 minutes. This is a calculation question. So if you've got your Casio nearby, you want to blow the dust off it. We're going to take this function here. We're going to sub in uh, 10 for the value of t. So we're going to do this. Okay, like I said, the e to the power button, um, if my calculator is similar to yours, it's above the ln button on the far right. So see if you can put this calculation here into your calculator and see if you get an answer of about 56.4 degrees. Okay, now question C is the tricky one. It's the conceptual one. Find what temperature the cup approached as T approaches infinity. Now, this is a seemingly hard question because we can't put infinity into this expression. Of course, you could just grab your calculator and type in T equal to a million and you'll probably get the right answer, but that's boring. We're going to take the slow and methodical approach. We are going to think about what this function looks like. So first of all, we're going to think about what e to the negative something looks like. We had that on the previous slide. It was one of our graphs. It's the exponential decay model. The negative in the power turns us from left to right, which is exponential growth. We turn around and we go for a decreasing curve, which is exponential decay. Now, multiplying this curve by 60 means that that y-intercept of 1 is now going to become a value of 60. Um, so that starting point there is going to be 60. Then this whole curve is going to be shifted up by 20 units. So it's going to do this. All right, so that initial temperature of 60 has now become 80 right there, which is what we got for the first part. And now that asymptote that we've been shifted up by is 20. Okay, let's go through that again. We've got e to the negative something. Multiplied by 60 just makes it steeper, and that value there is going to be 60. The 20 shifts us up by 20 units. Obviously not very to scale, couldn't be bothered. All right, so we can see this red line as you go from left to right, as x gets larger and larger and larger and approaches infinity, the red line approaches the blue dotted line, which is how far the graph shifted up, which is a value of 20. Okay? So as t approaches infinity, this red line approaches the blue dotted line, which is how far the graph shifted up, which is a value of 20. Which kind of makes sense, because if you left a coffee cup in a room, why do you think the temperature of the coffee is going to gradually approach 20 degrees? Well, because that's probably the temperature of the room. If you've got a 20 degree room, the coffee can't go any lower than 20, because that doesn't make sense. That's not how physics works. All right, we're gonna finish off with a few fun facts for this video. Uh, this first one you may have seen before, but just in case you're unaware, this um, exclamation point in mathematics is known as a factorial. For example, if you wanted to do three factorial, what your calculator is doing is three times two times one to get an answer of six. If you're doing a five that's shouting, it means five factorial. It's five times four times three times two times one, which is about 120. My math is correct. Now, the reason you need to know that is because if you took one and you divided it by zero factorial, which is actually also equal to one, that's a long story, don't get me started. And then you did one divided by one factorial, one divided by two factorial, three factorial, all the way up to infinity factorial, and you added all these numbers together, the answer would actually be 2.718, etc. This expression here, if it goes to infinity, gets you the exact value of E. Fun fact. Don't ask me to explain it because it's really complicated, but I guarantee you that this is the correct answer for E. Another fun fact. If you take E 
and you raise it to the power of i times pi. Now pi is of course the ratio of a circle's diameter to its circumference, that's already a cool number. i is a number that's used in complex numbers, it's the imaginary square root of negative 1. So if you do e to the power of square root of negative 1 times by pi, and then you take away 1, the answer is of course nothing. There you go, that is a completely legit, 100% true mathematical equation. It's called Euler's equation. It's said to be the most beautiful equation in all of mathematics because it links uh, the five most important numbers in maths all together. E, I, pi, one, and zero, all in one beautiful little equation. Again, don't ask me to explain it. Very, very, very long story. And for the final fun fact, uh, if you have a function, which is e to the power of x, which we've already sketched a few times today, and then if we sketch the derivative of e to the x, so we did the gradient function, okay, wait for it, drum roll. If you derive e to the x, the answer is e to the x. It is the only function in the world that is its own derivative. Amazing, I know, completely mind blowing. Our entire next lesson is gonna be about using um, exponential terms with base e and doing some cool calculus. So stick around for that, that'll be tomorrow's video. That's gonna do it for today. You guys can have some practice out of your exercise and um, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Take care, bye.